John chapter 21, one verse of Scripture, verse 3. John chapter 21, one verse of Scripture, verse 3. John chapter 21, one verse of Scripture, verse 3. It reads in this wise, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. I want to talk just for a few moments from the subject, now what? God bless you. You may be seated. Now what? Now what? Peter, along with the disciples, find themselves, I believe, in the midst of a transition. A transition between what has occurred and the transition of what they are waiting to happen. They are at what I believe a precarious place in life, a difficult place in life, because all of us at some stage, if you have not found yourself in a place of transition, I believe you will find yourself in that very place. Keep in mind that we, he had just, they had just experienced not only the death, not only the burial, but also the resurrection of Christ. The challenge in their life, the challenge in Peter's life, is that things are not the way that they were before. Jesus, when you read according to, when you read the New Testament, there was eight to ten appearances of our Lord post-resurrection. Uh, Jesus came when the disciples were together, and they were there uh, in the room, and Jesus came in without a door or window being open, and he spoke to them, peace be unto you, be not afraid, it is I. When that happened, on that initial term, on that initial time, Thomas was not present. When you read in the previous chapter, you will discover Jesus shows up again. John the Revelator writes some eight days later. And when Jesus shows up, he goes directly to Thomas, and he tells Thomas, I heard you've been talking about you said that except you see with your own eyes and put your hands in my hand where you can feel the print and take your hand and thrust in my side that you will not believe. And after that, Thomas did exactly what Jesus, he, he re, 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 recapitulated the words of Thomas and Thomas placed his hands in Jesus's, placed his hand in Jesus's palm and in his side. And he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, listen, it took all of that to help you to believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult moment because Jesus has shown himself. You read, he showed himself to Mary. He showed himself to Mary Magdalene, Mary of Cleophas. He showed himself to the men walking on the Emmaus Road. He shows himself even to his disciples. But things are different because now Jesus is not hanging out like he did pre-resurrection or pre-Calvary. Remember when they walked together and Jesus would uh, calm raging seas and make winds and waves behave? Uh, remember when the, the, the little boy had the two fish five barley loaves of bread, and Jesus multiplied it, and it was enough left over, exactly 12 fragments left to, to, to fulfill the appetite of the disciples. It, 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 but it's different now because every day before Calvary, Peter, along with the disciples, had been walking with Jesus, had been talking with Jesus, had enjoyed the power that Jesus had on earth and how he illustrated that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. But now things are different. And they're different because now Peter and the disciples, they only see Jesus intermittently. And here's the thing with Peter, that the difficulty of Peter, remember, is that Peter denied Jesus. And even though he has not he has not had the opportunity to truly apologize. If you continue to read the text, 
you'll discover that it occurs. But up until this point in verse 3, Peter hadn't had the opportunity to tell Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus, Peter hadn't had the opportunity to tell Jesus, Lord, would you forgive me? He, that opportunity had not come. And so it places Peter in a place of transition, in a difficult place. Notice where he is. I, I believe he's in a holding pattern of ministry. I, I believe he's in a holding place of life. How do you come up with that? Because keep in mind that he, he, this is where he is. He, is. he is between a resurrection and, and between an ascension. Jesus has been raised from the dead, but Jesus has not yet ascended to the Father. That's where Peter is. He's, he's between transition. Where, where, where is Peter? Peter is between a resurrection moment and a resurrection movement. That's where he is. P Peter is stuck. He is stuck. He is stuck. Don't know what to do. Last time I really had a conversation with Jesus, I told him that all, though all of the other disciples uh, leave you and abandon you, I'm going to be here. But, but, but now he recognized that when Jesus needed him the most, Peter failed Jesus. What, what do you do when you find yourself in a holding pattern of life? Ever been there? Ever, ever been on an airplane? You left the place of your origin and you want to land at your destination, but they tell you that there is no terminal available right now, and so the plane has to literally uh, circle in the air? You, you're too far from home. You can't go back home. <laughs> and the only thing that you can do, it's a difficult place. It's a nerve-wracking place to be. To be, 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 to, to be right in the midst of a transition. Ever, ever called, ever called to try to get your merchandise right on the phone? And they told you that you were the 20th caller. And you know, they said, listen, if you hang up, they're going to put you right back at the front of the line. And so you have to sit there, sometimes frustrated, sometimes perturbed, to, to wait right there. Why is that? Because sometimes life places you in a holding pattern. I, I believe that's where, that's where Peter is. He, he's in a holding pattern. He, he's between the resurrection and between the ascension of Christ, and now he doesn't know exactly what to do. And so notice what he says in the text, verse 3. He, he says, he says, always the spokesperson of the group, he said, I'm, I'm going fishing. I, 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 I'm going fishing. And the other boys say this, we're going also. And the text says that when they go, notice that they do not catch a bite. I, I believe that they are fishing. I believe he is fishing, not because he really wants to catch fish. I, I believe that he is looking for something that is familiar in order just to calm his nerves. I believe he's looking for something that will settle him down. I believe he's looking for something that will just help him to rationalize the thoughts that are going on in his mind. I, I remember some several years ago, there was a there was a a, a sitcom called Cheers that 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 came on TV, and Cheers was the, the it's it's amazing because the theme song for Cheers was written by uh, a gentleman named uh, Gary uh, Portnoy. A and he was challenged by the producers to write a song, this is interesting, uh, uh, about, about likable losers. That, that's, that's the song, the theme song of Cheers. He says, write a song that it was hard-pressed. Gary, it was, di it was difficult for him to do. It was hard-pressed. But, but then he finally came up. He kept on playing around with his melody and playing around with this theme until he, he came up with this song, you want to go where everybody knows your name. It says you want to go where everybody knows your name, where, where, where all are glad that you came. You want to go to a place where you can see. You want to go where everybody knows your name. That, that was the theme song for the bar called or known as Cheers. I, I believe when you look at this text is that, that Peter Peter's bar is his boat. And what he aims to do is that he doesn't necessarily want to go where everybody knows his name, but he wants to go back to a place that's just familiar. 
He, he wants to go back to a place where he found solace. He wants to go back to a place where he found comfort. And because he cannot rationalize what took place on Calvary, and the mere fact that he denied Jesus is still messing with his mind. So in, in the midst of this post-resurrection drama, Peter says this, I'm, I'm going fishing. And when you look at the text, there, 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 there are three things that he had to deal with that I want you to get in the text. The first thing he had to deal with was this, is being caught between what's now and what's next. Caught between what's now and what's next. Caught between what's now and what, what, what is next. Here it is. Here it is. As he's caught, I believe that some of us are exactly where Peter is, is that we are caught between what's now and what's next. And the blessing is, is that Pentecost wouldn't occur until 50 days later, which gave Peter this opportunity to do two things. First of all, to process what he did, but also ponder what he did, to process and to ponder. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes if we're not careful, we can move too fast out of what we're in, and that causes us not to learn the lesson while we were in it in the first place. If we're not careful, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, you're not careful, you'll get in another relationship. You were scarred in the past relationship that you were in. And listen, it doesn't make sense to jump out of a relationship when you've been scarred to all of automatically jump into another relationship real quick. Can I tell you why that's not good? It's because you're going to take your scarred, bruised up self and you're going to put that on somebody else and what you're going to become is high maintenance in their life and you're going to say that they don't love you and it's not the fact that they don't love you but they can't deal with all of the scrambled eggs that you brought with you. That's why sometimes you got to stay where you are you got to stay where you are for a moment. That's why sometimes when you find yourself where you have failed a certain test, sometimes it's not good to take the test over too soon. Because if you take the test over in the afternoon when you just failed it in the morning, chances are you're going to fail in the afternoon as well. And the reason you fail in the afternoon is because you didn't really take time to study Glory to God, the very thing that you have failed. I, I believe Peter, Jesus has Peter where he is. He, he is between the resurrection and Pentecost. He is between the resurrection and the ascension. And I believe that where he is in his life is that he is in what I call the sally port of life. When I was going to visit someone in jail, to minister in jail, they told me, Reverend, you can go this way. And when I went this particular way, and I'd never been in jail before, and I never want to go to jail except to visit people in jail. And I went into the jail. They said, Reverend, you got to stand here. And I stood there, and then one gate opened. And they said, Reverend, you need to walk a little further and, and go up a little bit. And I went in. And when I went forward, I discovered that there was another gate in front of me. But I also discovered that the gate in front of me would not open until the gate behind me closed. And I don't know who this is for, but God says that some of you have been in this holding cell in this transition of life for so long. And God said, you've been waiting too long in a sally port. And the thing that I want to do with you is that I want to move you forward, but I can't open that door in front of you until you make up in your mind that you're going to close the door behind you. Uh, where's Peter? Where's Peter? Peter's in the salad port of life. What, what does it mean to close the door behind you? To close the door behind you may mean for you that you just need to be big enough. Put your big boy pants on. Put your big girl pants on and just say, I'm sorry. Just go to somebody and say, I apologize. Rather than you doubling down on a jacked up decision that you made, just be honest and say, I jacked it up. I don't know where my mind was, but I'm just asking for forgiveness. I just apologize. Sometimes it's the apology that is the thing that closes the door behind you so that the door in front of you can be open. Mm. Let me go here. I don't know who this is for, but, but for some folk, it's just paying people their money back. That's all it is. You just, yeah, yeah. Now, the ones who should have shouted are the people that loaned money and never got it back. You should have shouted. That was your place. Wish I had some help here. 
Yeah, just, just, just own up to what you did. Just say, hey, I borrowed the money. I got amnesia as soon as I borrowed it. But I'm of the mindset that I understand that I need to apologize. That, that, that's where Peter is. He, is. he is in this transition, still wrestling with what he did to Jesus. Understand this. He is caught between what's now and what's next. But I, I believe, I believe Jesus, Jesus knows where he is. Jesus knows where you are. And whenever you find yourself wrestling with something, a failure in your life, one of the things that you have to learn to do, glory to God, I believe, is to build on your memorial. To build on your memorial. To build on your memorial. I, I believe Peter is mourning in his spirit the thing that he did to Jesus. But there are times in life when you know that you have messed up, when you know that it was your fault, when you know that, that listen, everything that's happening, if the truth be told, it's not your brother, it's not your sister, but it's you who stands in the need of prayer. When, 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 it, when it is you, one of the things that you have to do when you have failed God and fail yourself is to learn to build on your memorial. Yeah, to, to uh, 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 September uh, for, uh, 11, 2001, when 9-11 took place, we, we, we saw terrorists attack these United States of America. George Bush, 43rd president of the United States, he, he said this. He said, one of the things that we're going to do, I love what he said, is that we will rebuild. But here's the thing that I didn't know at the time. I didn't know that they would build in the very place where the destruction occurred. Yeah, it's called ground zero. They, they, two twin towers, they fell, the ruin was there. And how amazing, if you go there right now and look at the plaza, it's called One World, uh, One World Center. When you, when you go there and look at it right now, they have all types of complexes, all types of memorial, but they've also built another structure. Why would they build a tower in the same place, in the same vicinity where the previous towers fell down. Here is it. Here it is. The reason they did it was because of this. Because every time visitors go there to look at tragedy and terrorism, you got to also look at triumph. That every time that, that visitors come and they look at destruction, you got to turn around and look at construction. That every time that they go there, when you look and see what the terrorists have torn down, you then got to look and see what God has allowed to be built up. And that's the reason why you got to learn to build on your memorials is because if you are not careful, your memorials will dog you out. But, but when you build on your memorials, it's a testimony that God is able when you build on your memorial. It's a testimony that a just man falls seven times, but he gets up again. It's a testament that when you build on your memorial, it says that you can't keep not just a good man down, but you can't keep a God man down. That when you look at your memorial, you understand that, check this out, it wasn't the end, but it was a new beginning that God was creating in your life. So I don't know what type of memorials that you are dealing with today, but but God told me to tell you, baby, build on them. God told me to tell you, hey, man, start some construction. God told me to tell you, get your hard hat, get your shovel, because if all you do is die here and look at what you're looking at, you'll never make it to the next leg where God desires for you to be. Somebody shout, build on it, build on it, build on it. God has him in this moment. To, to build on his memorial. He, he says, Peter says this. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm going fishing. I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm just confused. I'm not talking to Jesus like I was doing before Calvary. We don't talk like that like we used to. I don't see him. I, he comes in, he pops in, and he pops out. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, what, what happens? What do you do when Jesus ain't flowing like he used to flow? What do you do when you can't hear him like you used to hear? What do you do when you cannot see him like you used to see? Here it is. Here it is. You got a second thing you got to do is that you got to rely on faith to live through your failure. You got to rely on faith. You got to rely on faith. You got to rely on faith to live. Uh, 
Uh, somebody shout, live up to your name. Yeah, live up to your name. Live up to your name. Uh, that great theologian and intellectual, uh, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, great, great mind of the civil rights, uh, great, great, great mind, just erudite, just scholarly in nature. He wrote the intellectual argument and laid the foundation for the civil rights movement. And what Dr. May says this, he's, he has many quotes that are out there, but one of the quotes that he had, he says that, listen, the, the tragedy in life that's born in mind is not the fact that a person had a goal that they could not reach. That's not the tragedy. He said, but the tragedy is the fact that that person never had a goal at all. Yeah, that, 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 that's what he said. Not, not the fact you didn't have a goal that you couldn't reach, but the fact that you didn't have a goal at all. My, Michael Jordan, greatest basketball player of all times, talked about, talked about, yeah, he is, talked about, uh, yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. We're, we're, it's too early for that. We're not getting into that. We're not doing that this morning. <laughs> greatest basketball player of all time. <laughs> talked about how many shots he took, 9,000 some odd shots that he missed, 3,000 games that he blew, 26 game-winning shots that he had the opportunity to win. And he said, because he missed a shot, the team didn't win. He said, but the reason that I am a success today, and he said it, he said, because I learned from my failures. See, there, there are times, the, the, only, the only way, the only way, the only way you never fail is that you never try. The only way that you never fail is the fact that you've never, uh, listen, listen, in this life, you're going to have some failures. In this life, you're going to have some tribulations. In this life, you're going to have some ups and downs. In this life, you're going to miss it. But one of the things that you got to understand when it comes to the call of God in your life is that God factored failure in your call. That's, yes, he did. Yes, he did. I know I'm right about it. I know I'm right. I don't know who this is for, but for those who have found themselves in the midst of transition, I want you to know that God has no plan B for your life. God don't have no plan B. Okay, if this doesn't work, Gary, if this doesn't work, Steve, if this, no, 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 God don't work like that. God has one plan for your life. And the reason he called you in the first place is because he's God all by himself. He does not just know your past. He knows your present. He don't just know your present. He knows your past. He knows your present and he knows your future. And anytime God has called you to do something, it's because he knows more about you than you know about yourself. It's because he knows where you're going. It's because because he knows where you're going to land. It's because he has called you. If that's the case, it means that something is wrong with his omniscience. He is omniscient, which means he knows everything. So stop asking God, why did you call me? And lift your hands and say, God, I thank you that you called me because you know everything. Can I go here for a moment? With skeletons in your closet, he called you. With stains on your resume, he called you. With junk in your trunk and in your background, he called you. And if God calls you, can't nobody uncall you. If God ordained you, the, you're more than the world. When God has his hand on you, the devil in hell can't do you no harm. Somebody shout, live up to your name, live up to your name. Yeah, yeah, live up, live up, live up to your name. Live up to your name. Re re remember, remember when Jesus, I think it's in, in Matthew 4, 19, when he called Peter, he says, and notice, <laughs> Jesus called Peter the rock. When Jesus talks to us, you got to understand that he doesn't just talk to us, glory to God, about our present, but he talks to us about our future. Can, can I say that just for a few moments? See, one of the things that you have to learn about David, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 4, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 4, is that David, David, the king of Israel, comes to the throne, check this out, at 30 years of age. But David had been anointed 
the king of Israel, some believe anywhere from 10 to 15 years earlier. Are you with me? Oh, God has a sense of humor. God sends Samuel down to Jesse's house and say, the next king is coming from your house. Uh, Jesse began to line up all of them boys and the oil would not flow. At the end of all of those boys, uh, uh, Samuel asked Jesse a question. Do you have, y'all got any more, you got any more boys around here? He said, yeah, I got one, but he's a little ruddy, sawed off dude. That's my baby boy. He's out there, but he's keeping sheep. Samuel said, bring him in. We're going to sit down here. You got some tea? I'll just wait until he comes in. David comes in. Samuel gets up. The Holy Ghost speaks to Samuel. And when David comes in, the, oil, the, the Bible says he's anointed. The oil begins to flow. Watch this now. God has a sense of humor. He has anointed the king of Israel without a crown. He's anointed the king of Israel without a palace. He has anointed the king of Israel without servants. After his anointing, notice what happened. God sends him right back to where he came from to continue to do what he had been doing all along. Now, why would God do that? Because whenever God anoints, he anoints in the past for the present and in the present for the future. When God, I wish I had some help here. I wish I had some help here. I, I've, been putting, I've been putting a few pennies away deep for my baby, my grandbabies. I should have done it with my kids, but I love my grandbabies so much more than, than I do. Can I just testify? Anybody with me? That grandchildren are so much better than children. If you don't have any, as soon as you get them, you're going to say, I see what he was talking about now. Wish I had some help here. Been putting, been putting, been putting a little pennies away. I'm going to put these for my babies. I want my babies to get educated. I want them on and so forth. Now, 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 they're in various grades. It's called a 529 plan. Listen, listen. One baby's in this grade, another baby in that grade, another baby in this grade. But you don't get the 529 plan you don't get it. You can't use it when you're in the third grade. You, you can't use the 529 plan when you're in the eighth grade. I don't care if you got straight A's. You can't even use it in the 11th grade. Can I tell you what? You can't even use it in the 12th grade. It's not until you graduate out of high school and then move into college, that's when you can start getting the money. I don't know who this is for, but God said you ain't going to get it until you get out the third grade. You're not going to get it until you get out the eighth. Y'all ain't hearing me. You're not going to get it until you get Once you graduate, watch some doors close behind you and other doors open in front of you. Once you graduate and stop letting every little thing get on your nerve, watch how God works in your life. You want to know why it's not given to you good measure? Press down, shaking together, running over. That's because you can't, you ain't graduated yet. You can't handle what God is giving you when your mind is still on a memorial. You can't handle what God is giving you when your mind is still in the past. Forgetting those things which are behind. Paul says, I press toward a mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody shall press on in this house. Yeah. Yeah, you're not, yeah, yeah, you're not, you're not gonna get it. You, you gotta move out of transition. You're not gonna get it until you learn how to press on. Peter, 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 you, see, you know what his problem was? Is that he, he, he remembered what he should have forgot. And he forgot what he should have remembered. I'm preaching myself happy this morning. He, he, he remembered what he should have forgot and forgot what he should have remembered. Somebody put it this way. They said, oftentimes we should carve our success in stone and write our failures in the sand. We do just the opposite. We carve the failure in stone and write the success in the sand. That's what Peter did. He wrote, he wrote, he wrote his success in sand, and he carved his failure in a stone. 
He forgot what Jesus said. Glory to God. When Jesus said somewhere in Luke 22 or 23, he said, Simon, called him twice. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Any Bible readers in the house? But here goes Jesus. But I prayed for you. He should have started shouting right there. That was the glory piece right there. He said, but I prayed for you. And I prayed that your faith don't fail. Here it is. Here it is. And when you are converted, the ESV says this, and when you turn, go strengthen your brothers. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Your failure is your turning place. You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. He says, and when you turn, and when, I, I pray that your faith fail not, and when you turn, your turn, your failure is the time and the place where you begin to turn the corner. What do you mean by that? That's the time where God truly gets your attention because you understand that it's not by your might. It's not by your own power. It's by the Spirit, saith the Lord God of hosts. Peter, up until this point, I got to wrap this thing up, had been depending on his own spirit. That's why he wants to go fishing. Mm. And check this out. What's crazy in the text is this. He says, I'm going fishing. And when you read the text, the Bible says they do not even catch a bite. You want to know why when you go back to old stuff that it, you can't get no bite? You want to know why the club don't move you the way it used to move you? You want to know why old acquaintances don't move? You thought you were missing. You've been watching them on Facebook and see how they're going on all these trips and you just dying to get with them. And then as soon as you got with them, the first thing you said, I don't belong here. And the reason being, it don't bite like it used to bite. It don't feel like it used to feel. You used to have, need to have. You thought you wasn't having no good time unless you had some Hennessy and Coke. But now you've graduated that all you need is the Coke. I wish I had some help here. You know why? I wish I had some help. Because it ain't biting no more. Because that stuff that used to move you don't move you no more. Can I tell you why I don't move you no more? Because God never calls you out of your purpose. God always calls you to your purpose. I wish I had some help here. He's not calling you out of your purpose. He's calling you to your purpose. And when he calls you to your purpose, you got to mature and understand you can't hang with everybody. When you are matured in your purpose, you got to understand you can't sit with everybody. You can't flow with everybody. Oh, God, you can't even worship with everybody. Why is that? Because some people are not on your level. Yeah, you got to rely, rely on your faith to live, to live through your failure. Notice they went out there, can't, there ain't nothing biting, nothing biting, nothing biting. But then here is the third thing I want to show you about him, and I'm done, is that he had to understand that his purpose was not in his past. Yeah, I'm done. His purpose, his purpose, his purpose, his purpose was not in his past. They went out there and didn't catch one thing. See, when God delivers you and you mess around and go back to a place where you've been delivered from, you may catch something. I wish I had some help here. That's for your ears only. If you, if you, 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 if, if you're not careful, if you're not careful, listen, they, they're out here, you know why? Because you got, you have no business being out here. Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, you, you got to understand that you have changed and not only have you changed, but God has changed you. And, and, and just because you don't see God moving right now does not mean that God is not moving. Peter, what God is doing is that God is preparing you for the next leg. And to prepare me for the next leg, sometimes he got to deliver me from me. Sometimes he got to get me out of me. 
Sometimes my enemy is not across the street. My enemy is in my mind. My enemy is in my soul. And it's not until I can win the battle from within that that's when God is going to set me up and then, and then exalt my platform. That, 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 that's where he is. That's where he is. Notice, notice, and I'm done. The, the, the text says they did, not, they did not catch a bite. His purpose was not in his past. I don't know who this is for, but I'm done. Stop going back to old watering holes. Because ain't nothing biting there. That type of fish will make you sick. You can't eat that type of fish. And if you catch it, throw it back because it's not it, it, it's not for you. You got to find another playground. You got you to gotta find another coping mechanism. You got to find another place where you can deal with the failures of life. Understand this. You, you want to know now what? Now what is just wait until you hear God. Wait, 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 and because when you read the text at the end and I'm done, Jesus starts talking to him, Simon, loveth thou me? That, that, that was Jesus setting him up for the apology. And what the Lord was doing was getting his mind focused to understand, son, I know what you did, but you got to understand that when I called you, I knew that you were going to fail, but I still had faith in you. And aren't you glad about it that he has more faith in us than we have in ourselves? Aren't you glad about it that wrecked up and messed up and raggedy people that God can still use? Aren't you glad about it that you don't have to be perfect, but if you submit yourself to a perfect God, he'll take your imperfections and use it to his glory. Aren't you glad about it that he takes the foolish things to confound the wise? He takes the weak things to confound the mighty. Why is that? Because the Bible says he's not willing that any flesh glory in his sight. And I want you to know that you've got some stains on your spiritual resume. I want you to know you're just the person that God wants to use. Can I tell you why he wants to use you? Because he knows that when you get where you're going, you're going to open up your mouth and say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, do I have a witness? Is there anybody in this house knows that you're standing because God has been good to you. It's not the fact that you had it all together, but you serve a mighty good God that keeps you together. Do I have a witness? Is there anybody in this house knows that when you can keep yourself, we serve a God who's a mighty good keeper. Do I have a witness? He's a mighty good friend. Somebody said there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. But Jesus knows all about my struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend. What will he do for you? He'll wipe your eyes in the midnight hour can I get a witness what will it do for you he'll be your friend when friends walk off and leave what will it do for you when you're down he'll pick you up what will it do for you when you're out he'll bring you in can I get a witness when you're lost he'll save your soul say yeah say yeah do you know him? Can't you feel him? Ain't he like fire? Shut up in your bone. Say yeah. Say yeah. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. Pitied mine every groan. Long as I live and trouble rise, I'll hasten to his throne. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah, say yes. Now what? Now what? Now what? Quit looking at your failure. There, there there's there ain't no telling how many people who are watching, how many people who are present who don't get involved in church because they have not forgiven themselves. 
There are consequences to sin. But understand this, whom the sun sets free. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Some of you have been wallowing in failure ever since COVID. Can't get up off that couch for so I just don't know. I just can't. I, I, you know, I'd be, I'd, I'd be ready for, I just can't. I just. God wants to use you tremendously because you've been embodied and endowed by him with gifts and with talents. And he's given you, your, your talent is not clicking a mouse on a computer to go from one channel to the next. He has gifted you to serve in his kingdom. And if you don't know what else to do, David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to pitch my tent among the wicked. Look to your neighbor and say, do something, do something. Do something. Now give them this because I don't want them to go off being half caught. For Jesus, for Jesus, for Jesus. For Jesus, do something. Peter thought his failure. Jesus had already taken it into account. And now he got it. Once, read over there in Acts. Acts chapter 4, somewhere around, they told, they, said, they were telling them to, to shut up. He said, we only talk about what we've seen what we are witness. In Acts chapter 4, then he says this, when, they took, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the when the bishop, the pope, the, the archbishop, when the, when the top religious folk told him to shut, they said, we ought to obey God rather than man. They, shh, they were sold out then. Oh, give me one minute. My time is up. But you think that if Jesus wasn't real, if they didn't truly see Jesus do you think they would have carried on a lie to their death? I wouldn't have done it. Now, it's one thing for you to dupe me in life. I found out you wasn't the Messiah. And then, listen, I'm not standing up for no lie. And even if you did, you ain't going to die for one. Not with somebody with good sense. Them boys had seen Jesus, and they were sold out. Peter was hung upside down with his heels up and his head down. John bashed on an Isle of Patmos. James beheaded by the sword. Why? For their faith. They remember, my time is up, they were afraid. The tech, When you read the tech, they were afraid because they thought the same thing was going to happen to them that happened to Jesus. They were afraid. But after... Seeing and witnessing Jesus, that resurrection, and then on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost fell, psh, you couldn't tell them. Psh. When are you going to let him fall on you? When are you going to let him fall on you? To take your acumen, to take what he's blessed you with to use it into his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. You are the hope of glory. Thank you. There are times when you have us in holding patterns, but it's for our own good. It's to get some stuff out of us so that you can get in us and move us to where you want us to be. So I pray now for those who are without a church home, those who are not saved. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that your word has, has convict, that it is guided, that it is blessed. 
And I pray for those that have not professed you as Lord and Savior, that they'll do that today. And while we pray, everybody repeat after me in faith. I believe that Jesus Christ is God's only son. I believe he died. I believe he rose. I believe he is God. I invite him into my life today to become my personal Lord and my sovereign God. Forgive me, Lord, for being a sinner. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, would you bless the Lord? 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 And I want to do this very quickly. If you're without a faith family or church home, and if the Lord has moved upon your heart to become a part of this ministry, I want you to, I want you to come down. I'm going to give you that invitation. You can go to joinhopewell.com forward slash 